I'm working on a study right now uh, that has to do with uh, intimacy, but usually when you mention just mention the word intimacy, most folks, you know, immediately begin to think about the physical. And um, I'm not speaking on the physical level, um, but there is really a misunderstanding today and really there's a perversion when it comes to intimacy uh, in conversation. Intimacy in conversation does not have to lead to the flesh as it most of the time does. And so I'm working on a, a study right now. This is my own study. But out of that study, I hope that you will benefit from what I glean, what the Lord reveals to me. As I've been telling you for months, just because the world is immoral, impure, ungodly, does not mean that you and I need to be affected by that or infected by that. There is hope that we can live for Jesus in this hour, folks. We can live for the Lord if we want to. And so this message I've entitled Conversation Without Covetousness. <clears throat> what does it mean to have a conversation without covetousness? First of all, let's lead, read the verse of Scripture, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. When you're having a conversation with somebody, is there an underlined motive? Are you being sincere? Or are you having that conversation for the sole purpose to gain something? Are you trying to get something? Most conversations that go on today are conversations that are unfortunately self-centered, selfish gain. When you have a pure, unadulterated conversation that is intimate, that is transparent, laid open, where there's nothing that you are trying to hide. Now, first and foremost, that needs to be between you and Jesus. That open relationship needs to be between you and the Lord. But out of that relationship with the Lord your relationships with others should be transparent. Does that mean that you tell everybody you come in contact with or everybody that's around you knows you? Is it wrong to be private? 
Is it wrong to have privacy? I believe that Jesus Christ was one of the most private people that ever was upon this planet. But there are certain ones that he shared things with that he didn't share with anybody else. You don't read in the scripture that all the disciples laid their head upon Jesus' breast, upon his heart, upon his chest. Jesus, maybe he did, maybe others did, but it wasn't recorded. But God wanted it recorded that John was leaning on Jesus. We see in the scripture where Jesus took three of his disciples a little further than the others. That means that they were privy to something that the other disciples were not. Was the Lord any respecter of persons? Why did God choose three disciples out of the twelve and take them a little further? You know, that's really God's choice. That's not for you and I to question. That's like Peter saying to Jesus about John, what's this man going to do? Jesus said, what's that to you? You follow me. There's a lot of envy today, a lot of jealousy in the body of Christ. You know there's envy in the world. They're constantly eyeing each other, all the way up the ladder. All the way to the top of the pyramid, they're eyeing one another. In fact, that's what that eye is. That all-seeing eye, they call that all-seeing eye. Madonna just recently came out not too long ago with a song called The Illuminati. And she says that all-seeing eye, she said in her song, she says it's not about all these people you think that are in the Illuminati. She said it's not about the United States of America. She said it's not even about altogether a new world order. She said it's all about that all-seeing eye. That eye that knows all things, she says. Well, she's talking about that eye of envy. The eye of greed. Unfortunately, that's the only eye she knows about. But we know, praise God, that there's an eye in the storm. Amen? In Psalm 32, 8, I will guide thee with mine eye. The Lord's eye. God's eye. We need, folks, to be known by the Lord and to know him. Because Jesus is going to say to many, I never knew you. So we need the Lord to know us intimately, heart to heart, laid bare, opened up and naked before the Lord, our hearts, nothing hidden. So even in our prayer needs to be without covetousness. The scripture says that you ask and you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts. So you can even pray. Your prayer can be with covetousness. And you're not going to receive anything if you're covetous when you're praying. So do you see the need for a very, to have a pure heart? For our hearts to be purified. Purified. 
This is a, a work that only God can do. This is not something that you and I can do, folks. And it's the truth. It's the truth of God's word that purifies our hearts. When that word of God is quickened and made alive and made real, it's that truth that cleanses, that heals, that delivers, that makes us free. This should be a cry in every one of our hearts for truth, for divine truth, for the truth of God's Word, for a revelation of the Word of God. Just because it's called truth doesn't mean it's truth. I've been working also on a study about philosophy and the scripture says, do not let men spoil you with philosophy. And I've been looking at this word, philosophy, and if you look it up online on the internet, you'll see that they say it's truth. Philosophy is truth. That's what they say. Is philosophy truth? What does the Bible say about philosophy? Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. And that word deceit means strong delusion after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. That's where Jesus said, you make the word of God of none effect because of your traditions. And here in Colossians it says that you'll be spoiled, you'll be spoiled through philosophy of strong delusion and tradition of men. The same thing that was going on in Jesus' day is going on today. Secret societies. Esoteric. Doctrines of devils. And, you know, John Kennedy actually brought it out. John Kennedy said, covet means... What was he talking about? Self-gain? Covet means. Tit, he, he said it was tightly knit organization. He called it a machine. That's what got him killed, folks. It's because he began to speak out against the secret organization that's bringing about this new world order. The whole world is caught up in covetous talk, covetous conversation. But we need to be sincere, without wax, without hypocrisy. Our conversation cannot be laced with an alternative motive. We cannot have conversations, especially with our brothers and sisters, but we can't have conversations with anybody where our conversation is not to give, but we're trying to get. God forbid that we're using people. Amen? We don't use people. We're not supposed to be using people for our own selfish gain, for our own selfish end. 
like the world, they say, well, these, this is just a means to an end. No. We don't, we don't use people. We don't abuse people. We don't step on people to get to the top like the world does. In fact, the scripture says that we are to lay our lives down for one another. Now, this is completely contrary to the way of the world and its rudiments. But we're not supposed to be like the world. I'm going to read this verse of Scripture to you again. We're going to go deeper into this study in the months, in the days, months, weeks ahead. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world. And that word rudiments means principle, the principles of the world, and not after Christ. And I believe a, a great scripture that goes along with this is where Paul said, Beware of the subtility of the serpent, that you be beguiled, that you don't be beguiled by the subtility of the serpent, as Eve was beguiled. Do not leave the simplicity that's in Christ. Our hearts, our spirits, who we are, all the way down to our core of our being, there should be nothing in us that is covetous or that has covetous practices. When you're coveting, when you're practicing covetousness, that's lust. That's not love. Amen? Love is not covetous. Jesus didn't come into this world to see what he could get. He came into this world to give his own life. Whenever we're in that mode of trying to get something, and if you're trying to get something un not being honest, if you're trying to get something that's not um, straightforward, you know what I'm talking about. What does it mean to be, to practice covetousness? It's when you are concerned about your image. You're concerned about what people think of you. You're playing the game, so to speak. You're playing... The, you, you, you're playing the game of politics. And that's not just in the government. There's politics in everything, even in the church. It's games. And you and I, brothers and sisters, should not have any part in it. We should have no part in games. Which leads me to the other part of this message, which is the really the thrust of this message. And that is that the word edify. Now, this is what I really want to get to in this message, to edify. It is a absolute uh, blessing to have the privilege to edify folks. Romans chapter 14, verse 19. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. That word edify means to build up.
First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 12. Even so ye, for as much as you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that you may excel to the edifying of the church. Again, building up. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's what ministers are on this earth for, true ministers, to edify, to build up the body of Christ. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Amen. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. And then, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 4. Now listen, folks, you can go back and listen to this study again with your Bible and look up these scriptures. It's a good study. 1 Tim Timothy chapter 1, verse 4. Neither give heed to fables, endless genealogies, which minister questions, rather than godly edifying, which is in faith. So do. Edification. If, if your conversation is not building, spiritually building somebody up, it's not pleasing the Lord. And that doesn't mean that a minister uh, is not able to tear down, but he's not tearing down that which is spiritual, he's tearing down the flesh, he's tearing down carnality. Like Je uh, God called Jeremiah to root out, to pull down, but to build up, to plant. A true minister knows how to do both. It's not just about building up, but if you're not called into the ministry, then you have no business tearing down or rooting up. And if God uses you to edify, you thank God for that. Because God can use anybody. He can use a donkey. But you're definitely not called to build, uh, to destroy or to tear down or to pull up, pluck up. Now, there's a verse of scripture here that does not pertain uh, to everyone as many might think. The Lord did not give everybody in the body of Christ as not a minister. Now, there's a lot of folks today that are running, going, and God never sent them. That's dangerous. If the Lord has not sent you and you're running, that's dangerous. Now let's look at this verse of Scripture. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, or the building up of the saints, 
for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, the building up of the body of Christ. Now, what was the reason why they crucified Jesus? What, what was the false accusation they used to crucify him? He said, he said he was going to destroy the temple. He said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll, I'll, I'll build it up. He's, he's encouraging the people to destroy the temple. With their carnal minds, they're thinking this. But Jesus wasn't talking about the physical temple. They thought Jesus was, a, was encouraging people, burn it down, destroy the temple. But he wasn't talking about that. He was talking about his body. He said, destroy this temple, my body. And in three days, I'll raise it up. They couldn't get it. They didn't understand it. And that's exactly what this verse of Scripture is talking about. The Lord's given some, some, not everybody's a minister today. Not everybody's been called into the ministry to build up, to edify. And there is a outcome of this, and that is till we all come into the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What's the purpose of the ministry? The real, true ministry. What is the purpose of the ministry? Till we all come to the unity of the faith. To a perfect man. To a perfect man. And what's he talking about when he's talking about perfection? He goes on to say that you henceforth be no more children. So he's talking about maturity. I said to you, or I said to some folks on Facebook the other day when they were on 2020 talking about uh, these two girls that killed their little friend, stabbed her 19 times, that my question was, and I typed it into Facebook, my question was, where are the adults? No, my question was, who are the adults? And I just heard them on the news last night asking the question concerning the White House. Where are the adults? So I'm not the only one asking the question. When you've got, you know, when you've got the news, Fox News, asking the question, where are the adults? And saying that the White House are acting like a bunch of children, spoiled children. Because Netanyahu is supposed to be coming to the United States because the House Speaker has asked him to come. And Obama is throwing a tissy fit, or a hissy fit, I guess they call it, having a tension tantrum because he didn't know anything about it, and he's not going to go to the meeting, and now the Democrats are not going to go to the meeting. I mean, what a way to completely dishonor, uh, you know, it's just so dishonoring. Not children, not children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine whereby uh, men lie in wait, cunning craftiness, to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, that's what we should be using our tongues for, our mouth for. Godly edification. But speaking the truth in love, 
not philosophy, the truth, the Word of God, the truth, but speaking the truth in love. You may grow up into Him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Not everybody's been called into this ministry. And there's a lot of folks today thinking that they are ministers, uh, going about as a minister. I mean, there was a time when folks shied away from sharing the Word of God. But today, it seems like everybody call, thinks they're a minister. Everybody thinks they have a right to teach someone else the Bible. That's a fearful thing. If God has not called you, if you've not been anointed, if you've not been chosen, if you've not been appointed by God, then make, you know, make up your mind that you know, you're doing it in yourself. And anytime you're doing something that's self-centered, the devil gets into it. The devil gets into the mix. I mean, my goodness, folks. Uh, Madonna has a song out called The Beast Within, and she quotes from the book of Revelation. And much of the what she quotes is directly from the book of Revelation. I'm really analyzing and, and looking over what she wrote down to see if she's trying to twist it. Because we know the devil even came to Jesus with the word of God. Amen? And we know that the, the, the serpent is very subtle. So I've been really analyzing and looking over the lyrics that she put in this song, The Beast Within, um, so that I might maybe be able to see how she's trying to use God's word I know it's mockery. I know it's blasphemy. But at the same time, how is it being used to deceive? I mean, think about this. You got someone as wicked as, a, as Madonna quoting the scriptures, and people hear her quoting the scriptures. That desensitizes people from the awe of God's word. They know how wicked she is. Did you know Madonna means she knows? That's what it means. She knows. She thinks she's the Blessed Mary. And I don't mean Blessed Mary as far as the Bible. I mean as far as the Catholic Church. I want to read one more set of lyrics to you. And this is also called The Beast Within. This is not Madonna. This is someone else. Listen to this. I don't know how I got here, but we cannot get out. I'm surrounded by strangers as the music starts to pound. I see the bodies slowly swaying, moving side to side. I feel the animal is rising as I slowly come alive. Some... Uh, everybody start, or so, everybody starts to move now. I want to see you all give way. I want to tear this, I, I want to tear this place apart tonight and have you thank me for my rage. Tell me what you came for. Can I give you just a taste? I want to see you lose your minds and rip apart this place. I'll tear you apart. I'll feed off of your heart. I want to see your bodies grinding just for me. I'm just what you need, the perfect disease. Don't you want to turn the beauty into the beast? 
into the beast. Endorphins start to swell now as I step up to my throne. Are you listening? The stage is their throne. I feel the monster caged inside of me, screaming through my bones. I want to see you start to sweat now. I want to see you lose your minds. I want to feel you all from deep within, swaying back and forth all night. These, you think this is just a girl singing this? Or do you think this is the devil? I tear you apart. I feed off your heart. I want to see your bodies grinding just for me. I'm just what you need, the perfect disease. Don't you want to turn the beauty into the beast? Into the beast? Let me see you bleed. Let me hear you scream. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Let me see you move. Let me hear you say. Let me hear you say. I see the body slowly swaying, moving side to side. I feel the animal rising. Turning the beauty into beast. Into the beast. The animal rising. This is right out of the playbook, folks, of Alistair Crawley. He called himself the beast. Animals don't do the things that these people do. That they give themselves over to. And again, I can't call them people anymore. The Bible calls them brute beasts. We're living in a world where beasts are taking over and where the false prophet and the Antichrist are both a beast. There's a beast system being set up. And they're going beyond men with men and women with women. Bestiality. How far did Adam and Eve fall? Well, according to the scripture, below the animal kingdom. Do you know what that means? That means... The animals have rule over them. And that's exactly what God's going to allow. He's going to let the beasts of the field, the beasts are going to literally tear. God's going to allow this. I told you, before it's over, the wild animals will be running in the streets. Covetousness. Covet means. Covet practices. Folks, don't believe the lie today when somebody like Madonna sings a song about love. The last thing that she's singing about is love. It's lust. And you and I should see that it's night and day. There should be nothing in us in any way that gives sway to lust. Lust takes, love gives. You'll never find love taking, always giving. That's why the scripture says, give and it shall be given to you. That's why he says in that verse of scripture he talks about let your conversation be without covetousness. He says the Lord said he'll never leave you, never, never forsake you, to be, consent, to be content with what you have. In other words, don't go to people. Don't ask people for help. What's he saying? Go to Jesus. Go to the Lord. The Lord will never leave you, never forsake you. All you have need of is in him. That's what he's saying. And the more the Lord gives you, the more you have to give. 
And then when you're connected to an unlimited supply, you have more to give. And that's what it's all about. But when you don't have a connection with the Lord where you are connected to the source of everything, everything good, then you can only give limitedly. Amen? We want to be able to give unlimited. To unlim- be, have a the source of unlimited supply. Unlimited supply, folks. Whatever someone has need of, we'll be able to... <coughs> excuse me. We'll be able to see them receive what they need. God is unlimited. So we should be, as ministers, connected to that unlimited supply. Whatever somebody has need of, we should be able to give them what they have need of. And we certainly can't do that if we ourselves are involved in covetousness. So let your conversation be without covetousness.